Time to look at another exam. Ooh. All right, so this is for Calculus 2, also known as Math 166, a classic exam from fall 2023. And we're going to be talking about techniques of integration. So we've got our partial fractions, our trig substitution, all that fun stuff, and a lot more coming up. Seven prompts to explore. And of course, as always, if we want to get the credit, Got to make sure we put our name on it. So we'll start there. And uh, now, with that out of the way, we're ready to begin. Number one. We're asked to find the following integral. It's a definite integral. You can see we have bounds here. So our answer is going to be a number. And it's the integral of tangent cubed theta secant to the fourth theta d theta. So this is an integral that involves only tangents and secants. And so, so now we know there's sort of three categories that might happen. And they are the following. Namely, we might have integral and we have stuff with tangent and uh, times secant squared, theta d theta. That's the first thing that might happen. Or we might have integral stuff with secant and uh, and then times secant theta tangent theta or the third thing is we might have secant to an odd power theta so those are the three now you might say well wait hold on this isn't any of those well yes there's one other thing that we have in our pocket that's going to be very handy and that is to say that secant squared and tangent squared are basically the same. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean the following, that tangent squared plus one is equal to secant squared. So in other words, if I see a tangent squared, I can replace it by secant squared minus one. If I see a secant squared, I can replace it by tangent squared plus one. So we say, okay, now of these three, which ones do we like and which ones do we not like? Well, it turns out that actually uh, we like some of these. So this one is a happy thing for us because it's something we can actually succeed in. And so is this one. And this one, no. Ugh. Ugh. Secant to an odd power, not our friend. And to do secant to an odd power involves integration by parts and lots and lots of work. Okay, so which one of these are we in? Well. Uh, let's think about it. If you pull off a secant squared, you'd be left with a secant squared. But then secant squared is like tangent, so we can write it as stuff with tangent secant squared. Okay. If we pulled off a secant and a tangent, we'd have a tangent squared, but tangent squared becomes like secant squared. So we can write like stuff with secant, secant tangent, which means double happiness. This is great. So we have two options. Now, one is not superior to the other, but I would say I'd give a slight edge to if you can put it in stuff with tangent to secant squared. I think it's a little bit more comfortable for most people because they're a little bit more familiar with the way that tangent works. Okay, so let's start there. So, idea. We have our integral, 0 to pi over 4, and we're going to pull off a, a secant squared. So we'll do this in a few steps, we have a tangent cubed theta, and then we'll have a secant squared theta, secant squared theta, d theta. Now, looking ahead, the reason that we're doing this is that the n term, the secant squared theta, d theta, this is going to become our du in just a few moments. But before we get to that, first thing we have to do is handle that secant squared. And this is where our identity comes into play. All right, well, so this is the integral, 0 to pi over 4. And then we have tangent cubed. Tangent we already like. Secant squared is tangent squared plus 1. And then we have our secant squared. All right, now with this in place, we're ready. We're going to do our substitution. And uh, what's our substitution? Well, our substitution is tangent because the root of tangent 
is secant squared. All right, so we'll set u equal tangent theta. We'll set du equal secant squared theta d theta. And what do we get? What comes out of all of this substitution? Well, uh, all the tangents become u's. That's good. So we have that this is the integral, u cubed, and then tangent squared is u squared plus 1. And then secant squared uh, theta d theta is du. And the bounds? Oh, be careful. Remember, these are theta bounds. We want to go to u bounds. See, 0, that's our old bound. Theta equals 0. That's not necessarily our new bound, right? Because we're, not, we're back into terms of u. So now, instead of 0, we're going to start at 0. Okay, why is that? Well, because we're plugging 0 in for theta. And tangent of 0 is 0. Okay, now we'll do the same thing. Pi force, that's our u bound. Plug in pi force. Tangent of pi force is 1. Okay, 0 to 1. All right, now, like, wow, this is an integral I like. Yeah, in fact, if we multiply this out, this becomes the integral of u to the fifth plus u cubed du, which is the integral of a polynomial. All right, well, what is that? Well, we, we know the rules. Add 1 to the exponent and divide. So u to the fifth, well, that becomes u to the sixth, and then we divide by 6. u cubed, well, that's u to the 4th, and we divide by 1 fourth. And here we go. It's a definite integral, so you evaluate 0 to 1. Now plug in 0, you get 0. We like 0. Plug in 1, and we end up with 1 over 6 plus 1 over 4. Now that's the same as 2 over 12 plus 3 over 12, common denominator what divides, uh, what, what does 6 and 4 both divide into is 12. And so that gives us our final answer of 5 twelfths. And there we go. We're done. Ah, nice. And so, of course, the thing to remember, if it's only tangents and secants, you're shooting for one of these two forms. And remember, a secant squared is just as good as a tangent squared. And you can swap them by the identities. All right. Well, that was a good start. Let's keep going. Number two. We're asked to find another integral. It's also definite. See, we have our bounds here. And this one, well, there's no trig. It's 16x squared on the top, square root of 1 minus 4x squared on the bottom. Ooh. Well, this is going to be an interesting journey. Okay, now, there's a signal being sent here on this problem, and, and it's a common one that we should learn to recognize. Namely, we see a square root. Now, why do I say that's a signal? When you see a square root involved, well, one of the goals is we really want to get rid of the square root. And uh, the way that we do that is by a technique known as trig substitution. Because, uh, well, we have identities, you know, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Those kinds of identities help us get rid of square roots. Okay, so now we have to sort of remind ourselves how this all works. So let's do a quick review, quick recap. All right, so if you're talking about trig substitution, they fall into a couple of categories. So our first category, suppose you have that you have, oh, let's say u squared plus a squared. And that's what's inside the square root. Well, okay. Well, then what you do is you say u is a tangent theta. So I'm thinking of a as a number and u as the thing which varies. Well, if you have u squared subtract a squared, well, then the right substitution to make is a secant. And finally, if it's a squared subtract u squared, then the right substitution to make is the sign. Now, there are some things you can play with. For example, you could also make a substitution here, cosine, 
but we find sine is a little bit easier to work with because there's a, a little bit less signage going on. And, uh, that's another story for another day. And, and why does this all work? Uh, just to remind ourselves, so for instance, we see we're in the number squared minus something that's changing squared. So, so we know we're in this case. When we put in u as a sine theta, we end up with a squared minus a squared sine squared. Well, that's really like one minus sine squared, cosine squared, and cosine squared. We can take a square root of cosine squared. Yes. Okay, so this is why it all works. It all comes back to our trig identities. Okay. So that's our, our little handy guide for us. So, okay, so let's see what we have specifically for us. Well, we see here this is 1 minus, uh, I'll write it as 2x squared. Okay? All right? Because I'm, I'm going to put the 4 and have it be part of the thing that's being squared. Now, we say, well, this 1 is 1 squared. So, a is 1 and u is 2x. So, idea. We're going to make the substitution. 2x is equal to sine theta. All right. Good. Good. Now, Let's start figuring out what happens here. Well, uh, taking derivatives, we'll have that 2 dx is the derivative of sine is cosine. All right, well, that's going to be helpful. And uh, let's think about our expression here. And uh, so before we did the substitution, downstairs we wrote this as the square root of 1 minus 2x squared. So I'm going to want to write the 16x squared, kind of like x squared, if you will. So I'll think of this as 2x squared. Well, that gives me what? That's 4x squared, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And well, I have 16 here. Well, that's OK. I'll put another 2 and another 2 on the end. So 2 dx. So I'm, I'm taking the 16 and I'm breaking it up into a couple of parts. All right. Now, there's, uh, if you don't like that, there's other ways to proceed. I'm just trying to make things look like 2x so I can see how to substitute in. All right. Now, we carry out the substitution. Let's change colors. Ah, I like changing colors. Okay. Well, what do we have? We have an integral. We'll deal with the bounds in a second. Downstairs, well, the 2x became sine. So this is the square root of 1 minus sine squared. The 2 is a 2. This 2x squared is sine squared. All right. And now this 2dx is cosine. All right. Good. Progress. Progress. Good progress, actually. Now are we done? Not quite. We have to handle the bounds. Okay, so let's go to the bounds. Let's talk about them. Now, these are x bounds. So what we do is we plug in the x and see what is theta. So we come here. So plug in x equals 0. 2 times 0 is 0. Well, when does sine give you 0? And the answer is sine of 0 is 0. So that says the lower bound is 0. We've been really lucky with the problem so far. This is not always the case that 0 will always stay 0 on substitutions, but, you know, let's keep going with it. Okay, then we come to a quarter. Okay, so 2 times a quarter gives you a half. What angle is sine of a half? Or rather, let me rephrase that, sine of what angle gives you half? There we go. That's what I, I should have said. Well, all right, so let's imagine... We quickly draw the unit circle, and we say, all right, that looks circleish enough. And, uh, well, uh, we put in our axes. Now, sine is the y value, so if I want sine of a half, uh, excuse me, sine to be a half, that says I'm looking for this angle. Now, that's a pretty shallow angle, and we know we're looking for one of our nice angles, because 1 half is a nice number that comes out of sine. So that's what angle? It's 
by 6. So you say, oh, okay. So now we're going from 0 to pi 6. Great. Progress. All right. Now, uh, can we clean this up? Well, yeah. See this square root of 1 minus sine squared? We talked about this. This becomes the square root of cosine squared, and that's cosine. Now you might say, oh, Steve, shouldn't it be absolute value of cosine? Well, oh, you're, you're, you're on the ball. Uh, it would be absolute value of cosine, but because we're going from 0 to pi over 6, cosine is positive, and so everything is good. Now what's the punchline? Well, the punchline is you have a cosine downstairs and a cosine upstairs. They combine to cancel. And so, we now have, this is the integral, 0 to pi over 6 of 2 sine squared theta d theta. Great. Wonderful. Okay, already this is looking like a much more palatable integral than what we started with. Well, how do we integrate sine squared? Well, the answer is we rewrite it, which is not too surprising. And so there's some nice facts. So... Let's write down more nice facts, right? All these fun things that we get to learn. So one fun thing we get to learn is that cosine squared of theta, well, that's a half times 1 plus cosine 2 theta. And the other one is that sine squared theta, well, that's a half 1 minus cosine 2 theta. Ah, ah, okay. So what do we have? We have 2 sine squared. So we want 2 sine squared. Well, that's great. Just imagine, we'll find both sides of this by 2. You say, okay, so this is the same as the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of 1 minus cosine 2 theta. All right, now we're almost done. We've done all the hard part. We figured out the right substitution. We cleaned it up, and then we figured out to use our trig identities. Now we're ready for the payoff. Well, these are things we can integrate. The integral of 1 is theta. And the integral of cosine is sine. It's going to be the same positive, plus or minus. So since it's a minus, it's going to be a minus sine 2 theta. You'll notice there's a suspicious gap here. Make sure to account for that inside 2. It's easy to forget that. So how do you account for it? You divide by 2, or multiply by half. This is a definite integral, so we're going to plug in 0 to pi over 6. Now, a quick note, when you plug in 0, 0 is 0, and sine of 0 is 0. So, this becomes equal to pi over 6 minus 1 half sine, and now 2 times pi 6, that's pi thirds, pi thirds. Now that's a 60 degree angle. Now that really is this angle that moors up here. Well, what's the value of sine of pi thirds? And uh, well, the answer is it's square root of three over two. So putting this all together, we get pi over six minus square root of three to two makes four. And there we go. We did it. Ah, good for us. Good for us. We made it to the end. And uh, yeah, there's a little, lot of steps along the way, but just take your time. Make sure what's the right substitution to make. Clean it up. And then what you end up with is you end up with the trigonometry type integral. And you say, okay, well, how do I deal with that? Start using your trig identities. And, uh, and there you go. Life is good. Life is wonderful. Let's keep moving forward. Number three. We have the function f of x shown here as a graph. So we don't know what the function is in terms of, a, oh, here's an equation involving x. But we can see the graph of it. And what we're asked to do, you can see here, there's a, a word that jumps out before we've even read it. And it's in both part A and part B. It's the word approximate. So we're not trying to get the exact value of the integral. What we're trying to get is a reasonable approximation using information. In other words, 
This is numerical integration. All right, so let's start with part A. Use the trapezoidal rule to approximate the integral from 0 to 8 f of x dx using four subintervals. Give your answer as a single simplified fraction. Okay. All right, well, let's talk about what's going on. Now, we're going from 0 to 8. Okay, well, we can see that. And it says using four subintervals. And uh, the implication is that it's four equally spaced intervals because that's how the trapezoid rule generally is stated. So we say, okay, we're going from zero, so here's zero, up to eight. So what we want to do is we want to chop zero to eight into four pieces. Well, it's not too hard to do that. You can chop it in half and then chop it in half again. And uh, all right, so, so we have these four intervals. Now, how does the trapezoid rule work? Well, it more or less says, uh, treat things like you would a trapezoid. And you say, okay, how, how do you do that? Well, you would say, I'm going to, let's start with two to four. That's gonna be a little bit easier to see. So you imagine, you say, all right, well, actually it turns out that's not very exciting, two to four, you imagine there's, let's start four to six, there we go. <laughs> the problem with two and four is you see it's the same height. But uh, you're connecting, you basically play connect the dots. And so it's like you're turning it into a function, which is a sequence of straight lines. And the reason we call it the trapezoid rule is that these shapes here are trapezoids. And what we're going to do is say we're going to approximate this area by treating it like it were a trapezoid. Okay, so that's the philosophy. Okay, how do you actually implement it? Well, uh, the, the way you implement it is there's this nice pattern here. And I remember the trapezoid rule. It follows this pattern of one, two, 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 one. Okay, so what does that mean, this pattern? Well, there's a couple of things you do. First off, you say, what are the widths? And uh, so in other words, how far is it between your points? Zero to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight. And, uh, well, okay, you put that number down. Now, in terms of the formula, this is often written as b minus a over n. The next thing is you have a factor of a half. And this just comes from the rule. Now, the reason that you have this factor of a half is essentially because of all these twos. The last thing you do is you say, all right, now I'm going to fill in the data. So the ones are multiplying by the endpoints and the twos multiply the points in the middle. So I want to say, well, what is f of zero plus two f of two plus two f of four plus two f of six plus f of eight. All right, so let's recap. Two, that's our width. Our half comes from the rule. And then we have one, two, 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 one with our points. 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. So now, the nice thing, well, 2 and a half cancel. Good. And uh, we just need to find these values. And so we find them from the picture. Say, so what's happening at 0? Well, the answer is it's 3. Sorry, negative 3. So this is negative 3. And then here at 2, we have 2. And you have to go across. And that looks like a 5. Yeah, that, that, because it looks like a 5 because it is a 5. So then we have plus 2 times 5. And at 4, we have, again, 2 times 5. And here at 6, well, what do we have? We have 7 fourths. And we know we have 7 fourths because it says it right there. And say, okay, great. Plus 2 times 7 fourths. And then at 8, what do we have? Well, we have 17 halves. Again, it says it right there. So we don't have to guess, 17 halves. All right, well, so that's negative three plus 10 plus 10. Uh, two times seven fourths is seven halves. Uh, 17 halves, okay. Now, if you combine these two together, what do you have? We have seven halves plus 
17 halves. That makes 24 halves. 24 halves, also known as 12. So we have uh, 10 plus 10 plus 12 is 32. And then we have the minus 3, which leaves us with 29. All right, so there we go, 29. All right, well, that's uh, the trapezoid rule. Now, part B, Simpson's rule. Now, Simpson's rule is, how, how does that work? Well, I will tell you there's a little bit of controversy over what subintervals means, because there's different interpretations. But here, what it means is you're going to take two consecutive intervals, so let's say from 0 to 4, and you're going to say, well, imagine you had these three points, and we're going to find a quadratic that passes through those three points. And similar, here we have these three points, and again, we're going to find a quadratic which passes through those three points, and we're going to use those quadratics to find the area. So Simpson's rule is essentially, it's like, oh, instead of straight lines, Think of them as parabolic lines. And it says, well, yeah, that makes sense. Because most curves are curvy. You know, that's why we call them curves. Okay, so how do we remember this one? Well, uh, for this one, instead of the pattern 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 1, it goes 1, 4, 2, 4, 2, and so forth until the end. Uh, whoops, sorry, 4 on the end. So uh, it's 1. 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 4, 1 on the end. Okay. All right. So, here we go. When we're doing this, we have some things that are very similar. Namely, we have the width. So, it's the same width. It's the, the width of the interval. Okay. So, we have our B minus A over N term. So, that's our 2. Same part. And then we're times by a third. Now, where does this third come from? Well, if you think about it, we're having scaling factors of 2 and 4. Well, on average, if you scale half the time by 4 and half the time by 2, eh, ignore the ends. If What do you have? Well, you, ha you scale by a third, essentially, right? If half the time is 4 and half the time is 2, then essentially it's a third. Okay. All right. Now, here we go. So, Follow the pattern. So it's 1 times the first point, 4 times the second point, 2 times the next point, 4 times the next one, and now we're out. Okay. Now, we just have to go through and carefully carry out this computation. All right. So just remember, 1, 4, 2, 4, 1. Here's our pattern. All right, we get two thirds. Hmm. And uh, good news, these numbers are still the same. So f of zero is still negative three. And then we have four times f of two, which is still five. And two times f of four, which is still five. And four times f of six. Uh, well, that's four times seven fourths. All right, and then we have f of 8, 17 halves. All right, well, let's see, what can we do? Uh, 4 times 7 fourths, this is 7. And then we have, of course, we have our 10 and our 20 and our minus 3. So, uh, hmm. well, we'll try to this all in. They didn't give us a lot of space for Simpson's rule, even though it's a more complicated rule. All right, two-thirds, uh, 20 and 10 and, and 7. That makes 37. 37 subtract, subtract 3 is 34. So we have 34. And uh, all right, double 34 because I want to combine these fractions. So that's two-thirds. That would be 68 plus 17 over 2. Notice that the 2's cancel. 68 plus 17 is 85. So this gives us 85 upstairs and 3 downstairs. Whew. Good. We got an answer. Now, 
there's a quick check. Not that this will be able to say definitively right or wrong, but it will say reasonable or unreasonable. What's our quick check? These are both approximations. If I'm approximating, I'm not going to be exact, so it's okay that they don't match, but they should be close. So if I have one of them is very different from the other, that means I applied a rule wrong, and I should go back and look. So let's think about these. Are these numbers close? Well, uh, since this is an over 3, what's, what about this one? What would it be? Well, you times it by 3, that would be 87 thirds. Are 87 thirds and 85 thirds close? Yeah, they're only off by two-thirds, and that's relatively a small number compared to what these values are. Since they're close, that's a good sign. If they hadn't been, whew, panic, go back and revisit. But for now, we found them, our approximations, and let's keep moving on. Number four, we're asked to evaluate an integral, and now no bounds. These are indefinite integrals. We're finding antiderivatives. Cool, 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 cool. Now, what do we have going on here? Well, we have upstairs is a polynomial, and downstairs is another polynomial. It's two polynomials. Well, we call this rational. This is a rational function. And we say, all right, cool. How do you do rational functions? Well, the answer is partial fractions. So this is a partial fractions problem. When you see polynomial over polynomial, it's almost always a partial fraction problem. I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but like 98% of the time. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of some steps. Step zero, maybe we should call it. Do we need to do long division? Because sometimes you do. So before you start doing any fancy partial fractions work, ask yourself if you're ready for fancy partial fractions work. And the way you, you ask yourself, in, in other words, the way you answer that question, is you compare the degrees. Upstairs, what's our degree? Well, the highest degree is 3, so it's degree 3. Downstairs, what's our degree? Well, we have a x squared and another x squared, so it's x to the fourth degree 4. Now, the good news is we want the degree upstairs to be less than the degree downstairs, and it is. Life is good. If it hadn't been, we'd have to do long division. But they're being nice to us. Well, as nice as you can be given that we have to do a partial fractions problem, right? You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so now we're ready to do partial fractions. And uh, so this is algebra. In fact, a lot of the stuff you do, you might say, well, wait, the majority of what we're doing isn't, isn't the calculus part of it. The majority of this seems to be like algebra and trigonometry. You are correct. This is algebra and trigonometry being tested. Ah, I knew it would pay off paying attention in algebra class. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, the, the first part of doing partial fractions, that, now that we know that we are going to do partial fractions, we're not doing the integral, we're just putting that to the side for the time being. So you say, all right, we're going to pull this apart. Remember the goal of partial fractions says, instead of having one big thing, let's have lots of little things. And the reason we want lots of little things is because each one of them is something we can work with. And so we're breaking it into easier to digest bite-sized pieces. So we want to pull things apart. And we're going to pull them apart by their denominator. Now, the thing is, pulling the things apart by numerator, easy. We like that. By the denominator, work. And uh, but that's OK. We'll do some work. No worries. OK, so what are our pieces going to look like? Well, we see an x squared. So we say, all right, we're going to have to build up to that. So we have something over x and something over x squared. And then we see an x squared plus 1. OK, we're going to have one of those. And we say, OK, so this is our form that we're shooting for, except we haven't talked about the upstairs. Above the x is some number, a. We don't know. That's the point. 
above the x squared is b, and above the x squared plus 1, c x plus d. All right, good. Now, you might say, wait, why did the x squared plus 1 get uh, this sort of extra stuff, whereas the x squared didn't? Well, that's because of what's going on here. This is really, you know, the x being squared. And if just x by itself is what we would call a linear function. So because we have a linear function just being raised up in terms of powers, we don't have extra, extra luggage. The reason we need extra luggage here is x squared plus 1 does not factor nicely. And so we, are, we have some extra pieces that we have to account for. All right. So now that's probably one of the hardest parts. And the reason I, I call it a hard part is because if you don't get this, almost everything that comes after is going to be either miserable or not miserable and wrong. Uh, neither of those is desirable. So the big thing you want to make sure of with partial fractions is get down the form. Make sure you know exactly how to write the form for partial fractions. All right. So now that we have that, the next thing is clear the denominators. And that's because, well, fractions, they make us nervous. And uh, they do make me nervous. Maybe they don't make you nervous. But I've known that I've made so many mistakes with fractions over the years that one of my basic instincts is get rid of the fractions. And so I'm multiplying by this denominator. So we'll have 5x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 2 equals, okay, now, the first term, I have an x, and here there's an x squared, so I'll cancel a single x, so I'll have a times x times x squared plus 1. There's an x squared, the x squared is completely canceled, and so that leaves us with b x squared plus 1, and, uh, well, here, the x squared plus 1's cancel, and uh, so we'll be left with a cx plus dx squared. Now, there's a couple of ways to go from here. In fact, there's several ways. Ultimately, we have polynomial equals polynomial. And we're saying, okay, what are the right choices for a, b, c, and d so that this works? Now, the first thing I always try is to make good choices. Like, for example, taking a test in calculus. It's a good choice because it's a great way to pass the class. And uh, so what's a good choice here? Zero. Why is zero good? Well, you'll see it'll knock terms out. So let's do a quick plug in x equals zero. And let's see what happens. Well, we'll get zero, 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 two. Okay, so we get 2 on the left-hand side. Uh, 0 because of that. 0 over here. And here we'll get b. All right. So we come to the conclusion b is 2. We're a fourth of the way done. Unfortunately, <laughs> at this stage we're like, ah, we've run out of good choices. Well, that's okay. Even if you've run out of good choices, uh, you can still make progress. Now, if you're a wild and crazy person and you like living dangerously, it's not that dangerous, but you could plug in I. And fun fact, you get a two four if you plug in a complex number, but it's a little bit dangerous, so we're not going to do that. All right, so at this point we're like, well, I've run out of good numbers, so what we'll do is we'll now do the other popular route, which is to say, let's expand and group coefficients. So if we expand here, and I'm going to plug in the fact this is a 2. So we have, this is a uh, x cubed plus ax plus 2x squared plus 2 plus cx cubed plus dx squared. All right. True, true. 
Okay, now uh, what do we have? Well, this is a plus c x cubed, because those are the only x cubes. Then we have a d plus 2x squared, because those are the only x squareds. And then we have a plus a times x and a plus 2. All right, so we expanded and we grouped. And now we say, hey, polynomial equals polynomial. What has to be true? Well, coefficients have to match other coefficients. So the coefficient 5 has to match a plus c. The coefficient 1 has to match d plus 2. The coefficient 1 here has to match a. And the 2 has to match 2. Well, that would have given us b equals 2. Now, at this stage, we can like, oh, wait, I can quickly get the rest. I see, ah, a has to equal 1. So let me make some notes here. a equals 1. We already said b equals 2. What about c? Well, a plus c has to be 5. a has to be 1. So 1 plus something gives us 5. So that says c has to be 4. What about d? Well, d plus 2 has to be 1. So what number, when we add 2 to it, gives us 1? And the answer is negative 1. All right. So our great aha is we now say we can replace this portion of the integral with a nicer expression. And so in particular, Let's recap where we're at. So our original integral, which was 5x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 2 over x squared times x squared plus 1 becomes. All right. Now, here's another place where people make mistakes. Make sure you put the right values in the right places. So a, 1 over x, b, 2 over x squared, c, 4x, d, minus 1, over x squared plus 1. All right, so this is the partial fractions part. And that's why we call this technique partial fractions. It's going from here to there. All right, so let's talk about these integrals and say, okay, well, which ones are reasonable? 1 over x, pretty good. 2 over x squared, not too bad. Now, why do I say that? Well, first thing is you should rewrite this. This is really 2x to the minus 2. That's the calculus-friendly way to write it. Like, oh, 2x to the minus 2, we have the rule. Add 1 to the power and divide. All right. What about 4x minus 1 over x squared plus 1? Well, that one, as it is, isn't so friendly, but we can pull it apart. Now you might say, wait, wasn't that the whole point? You pulled things apart? We did by pulling apart based on the denominator. We can also pull apart on the numerator. So that this part is really the same as 4x over x squared plus 1 minus 1 over x squared plus 1. And you might accuse me of saying, but Steve, you're just doing that because you love arctangent. I do love arctangent, but it's also the key to solving this. And the reason I say arctangent, we have the integral of 1 over x squared plus 1. Arctangent, oh, ah, what a beautiful integral. All right, but what about the rest of these things? Okay, how do we handle this 4x over x squared plus 1? Well, that's, we're going to do a little bit of substitution. And in particular, you should think of this 4x as 2 times 2x, or x squared plus 1. And if you do that, you're like, oh, that's like you have a function downstairs and the derivative of that function upstairs. So this is a log. OK, so let's put this all together. What do we have? Let me move this up a little bit here. And what do we have? Well, we have that 
I'll, I'll rewrite this one more time. 1 over x, 2x to the minus 2, 2 times 2x over x squared plus 1, minus 1 over x squared plus 1, dx. So we have natural log of x. That's integral of 1 over x. Here, you'd add 1 to the exponent and become minus 1 divided by minus 1. That makes it minus 2. x to the minus 1, you put an x downstairs. Uh, 2, and then we said, hey, function derivative. When you see function downstairs, derivative upstairs, that says natural log of the downstairs. 1 over x squared plus 1, classic arctangent of x. And because we want all the points, it's an indefinite integral, plus c. And there we go. Ta-da! Wow. This one was a workout, but we made it. We got through. Okay, good, good. Let's keep going. Number five. We're asked to find the following two parts. So they're both integrals. Let's start with part A. The integral of log of 3x over x to the fifth dx. All right. Well, hmm, this should be interesting. And what do we see? Well, there's two things, right? There's the log and the x to the fifth. How do we handle this? Uh, well, the thing is, a log, that's hard to integrate. But it is easy to differentiate. And x to the fifth, yeah, we're pretty good at differentiating or integrating. So in particular, this is an integral which has a part which is hard to integrate, easy to differentiate. And there's no substitution hanging out ready for us to use. So you should always check substitution first. But when you see that, ah, hard to integrate, easy to differentiate, you say, well, maybe this is doing integration by parts, and because that's what we're going to do. All right, so what's our idea? Well, uh, let's just quickly recall what integration by parts says. It says if we're integrating u dv, then this is the same as u v subtract the integral of v du. So essentially, you, you differentiate the u part, you integrate the v part. And so it's sort of a shoop, you're swapping them. And the goal is, hey, maybe this is easier to work with. And uh, so, well, okay, so what's going on here? Well, uh, we have the integral, and I'll think of this as two parts. There's the log part, log 3x, and x to the fifth, I'll think of this x to the minus 5 dx. Now, the u should be something that's easy to differentiate, hard to integrate. So that's the clear candidate is the log. The dv is everything else. Now, sometimes it's pretty easy to spot. Sometimes you have to try. But here it's not too bad. All right, so now that we've done this, we should find these various other pieces. Uh, well, what's the derivative of log of 3x? And it's 1 over 3x times the derivative of the inside, 3dx, which, if you like, that's really the same as 1 over x dx. All right, well, what's v? It's the antiderivative of x to the minus 5. So that would be x to the minus 4, and then 1 over negative 4. Right? You add 1, negative 5 plus 1 is negative 4, not negative 6, negative 4, and then you divide. All right, so this becomes, we're going to have u, v, so minus 1 fourth, and, uh, well, x to the negative 4 is the same as 1 over x to the 4, and uh, log 3x. Okay, so these two multiplied together. And now we're going to subtract the integral of these two multiplied together, v du. 
So we're, we have our minus 1 fourth, x to minus 4, and then we have a 1 over x. All right, so let's, let's be careful here. What's going on? Well, first off, we can minus minus two wrongs, make a right, plus, and uh, all right. So then we can also, and uh, sorry, as I pause for a second to write the front here, pull out the 1 fourth. Now, x to minus 4, 1 over x to the fourth. And then I have a 1 over x to the fourth and a 1 over x is 1 over x to the fifth, which means that this is integral of x to the minus 5. Yeah? You could also think of it as 1 over x is x to the minus 1. x minus 4 times x to the minus 1 would be x to the minus 5. You add the exponents. Okay, well, could we integrate that. Yeah, it's the same thing that we just did over here. So this part will become minus 1 fourth x the minus 4. So we have, and if we want, we can clean this up. So this is a minus log of 3x divided by 4x to the fourth. And then here, 1 fourth times minus a fourth would be minus 1 16th. And then x minus 4 is an x to the fourth downstairs. And don't forget, plus c. All right. And there we go. Okay, good, good. Now, next part. Okay. Part b, integral of arctangent of x. Ah, and they gave us a hint. The derivative of arctangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Ah, oh, come on. Did we need that hint? That's emblazoned on our hearts. We know that. It's a part of us now. But okay, all right. So we know the derivative of arctangent. And in particular, arctangent is something easy to differentiate, hard to integrate. So we're like, oh, let's channel our part A. So it's also by parts. So we say, okay, in that case, what would our parts be? Well, this part easy to differentiate, hard to integrate, is our u. And that leaves dx is dv. All right, well, they told us what the derivative is. du is 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. And then the integral of 1 is x. OK, great. So what do we have? Well, this becomes uv, so u v, x, arctangent of x, minus the integral of v du. So minus the integral of x over 1 plus x squared dx. And now, you might say, okay, well, how do we integrate this? Well, we can do a substitution. And you say, well, wait a second. The derivative of 1 plus x squared is 2x. It's almost like the upstairs. And we say, yeah, sure, just put a 2 there. And they say, you can do that? Well, you can if you balance. So, for example, we can put a half in front. The half and the 2 cancel out. And now we're like, ah, we see function downstairs, derivative of that function upstairs. We say, okay, so this becomes x arctangent of x minus a half log 1 plus x squared Right? Function, derivative, becomes log. And so, because we want the points, we add plus c, and we're done. Wow. Ah, good times, good times. It's always great to see arctangent. I love it when there's an arctangent. All right, well, let's keep going. A few more problems. Number six. We're asked to use shells to find the volume obtained by revolving the curve y equals 1 over x squared plus 2x plus uh, x squared plus 2x minus 3 between x equals 2 and x equals 4 around the y axis. So they didn't tell us, but this is probably the curve that they're after. 
Now, will this help us solve the problem? No, but that's okay. They, at least they wanted us to see what the picture looked like. So what do we have? We have the area between two and four, and so we're taking that portion. I'll go ahead and, and shade it in here. Do, 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 do. So this problem now becomes a little bit more shady. Ah, fun, all right. Yeah, that's right, you know, if you've been going all the way through here, you, you deserve a pun somewhere in the middle. Okay, so there's our region, and we're going around the y-axis. Okay, and so we say, okay, great, no problem. So we think of our slices, and we spin, and yes, indeed, they will be forming shells. So, okay, great. So, recall, how does shell method work? So shell method says the following. What we're going to do is we're going to think of what's the, the shape of one tiny uh, shell. You need a couple of things. You need a 2 pi, and then you need a radius. And the radius is this distance from where we're spinning. You need a height, and the height is this distance from top to bottom there. And then you need a thickness. Now here, the thickness, you see it's not it's paper thin, right? There's this little tiny amount, which we usually call dx. That's the thickness. Now that's one shell. Add them up. So integration is all about adding up little pieces. Okay, so for us, we say, ah, well, we know where we're going from, two to four. The two pi is the two pi. The radius, well, if I'm at an x, how far is it to the y-axis? It is x units away. So x is how far you are from the y-axis. What's the height? It's the height to the function. So 1 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. And what's the thickness? It's dx. All right. Cool, 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 cool. All right, well, let's go ahead. Let's pull out the pi, and uh, let's put the 2x upstairs. The reason I pull out a pi is it's such a weird number to work with. We'll just leave that on the outside. And so that's the integral we're asked to do. So the shell method was just to say, get the setup. But now we still have paper left. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to integrate this. And we start by saying, well, what kind of integral do we have? This is a rational function, right? Polynomial over polynomial. Aha. So what are we going to need? Partial fractions. Cool. All right. So let's do a little side exploration. So you have 2x over x squared plus 2x minus 3. Now, can you simplify x squared plus 2x minus 3? In other words, does it factor nicely? Well, it, it probably does. Um, otherwise, there's no partial fractions involved in this problem. So let's think about it. We need two things that multiply together to give minus 3 and add to give positive 2. Well, how about this? Let's say a plus 3 and a minus 1. We can check, right? x squared, good. Minus x plus 3x, 2x, great. And then minus 3. There's also a clue from the picture. If I have x plus 3 or downstairs, x minus 1 downstairs, it says, where should I have asymptotes? Well, at negative 3 and at positive 1. So my function should be getting huge as we get close to 1. And you'll notice, here's 1, and it's going up pretty steeply. So blowing up at 1, yeah, that agrees with our factoring. Cool. Good for us. All right. Well, now that we have that, we say, okay, well, that's what we're trying to do partial fractions with. And we're pulling it apart on the denominator. So it's something over x plus 3 and something over x minus 1. So we say, all right, there's an A and a B. Okay. So at this point, we clear out our denominators. So we're going to multiply everything here by x plus 3 times x minus 1. And 
When we do that, what will we have? Well, we're going to have that 2x, because everything's been cleared out, is equal to a. The x plus 3 is canceled, so it's times x minus 1. And then the x minus 1 is canceled, so it's uh, x plus 3. Okay, now, what should we do? Well, let's make some good choices. What are some good choices? Well, good choices are things which get things to cancel. So suppose we wanted to cancel the x minus 1. What would you pick? 1. Okay, so at x equals 1, we would get that 2, 2 times 1, is a times 0 plus b times 4. So that tells us that, hey, b is a half. All right. Uh, what's another good choice? What well, cancels with x plus 3? Minus 3. Okay, so at x equals minus 3, 2 times minus 3 is negative 6. All right, minus 3 minus 1 is minus 4. So minus 6 is minus 4a. So that says a, well, minus minus cancel. That's nice. Uh, 6 over 4 is 3 over 2. All right, so there we go. A is 3 halves and B is 1 half. Okay, so now let's get back to our regularly scheduled problem. So this was all side work to say, all right, this integral now becomes pi integral 2 to 4 of, well, we're going to have uh, a, so make sure you get the right number in the right place. a is 3 halves. So we'll have 3 halves, 1 over x plus 3, and 1 half, 1 over x minus 1. Okay. All right. So we integrate. So this is pi. And then we have 3 halves log x plus 3 plus 1 half log x minus 1. And I oftentimes, people are like, oh, don't forget absolute value in logs. If you need them, throw them in. I'm someone who, who's not a big absolute values in logs person. I know some people are. And uh, so if you're paranoid, go ahead and add them. Uh, I usually don't worry about it until I need them, and then I just like, oh yeah, throw it in. Life is good. Okay, so uh, are we done? Not yet. We still got to plug in our numbers. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and pull out a half. So this is pi over 2, and then we have, when we plug in 4, we have 3 log, 4 plus 3 is 7, uh, plus log 4 minus 1 is 3. Okay, so that's plugging in 4. Subtract, plug in 2. We have 3 log 2 plus 3 is 5. And then plus log 2 minus 1 is 1. Now, some good news. Log of 1 is 0. So even though we can't read it, it doesn't matter. That part goes away. So we end up with pi over 2, uh, pi over 2. My mind was already jumping to that 3 there. 3 log of 7 plus log of 3 minus 3 log of 5. And you know what? Let's stop there. Yeah, we could try to cram it all together, but we wouldn't learn anything new. And uh, there we go. There's the volume. Whew! Wow! What a good workout. We still have a little bit more training to do. One more problem. Our final problem! Woo! We made it! Well, we still got to get through this last one. But we can do it. We can do it. All right, so let's see. What do we have? Uh, consider the value of each integral. These look pretty harmless. 
uh, 1 over x log x to the half. And we're going from 1 to 2. Uh, hmm. Well, wait a second here. 1. This is log of 1 is 0. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that this is going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, right? Because we're going to have a division by 0. Oh, so this problem, okay, so this one is about improper integrals. All right, so that's, that's what we're dealing with here. All right, so we got to keep that in mind. So in other words, an improper integral is an integral which involves infinity. And if you look ahead to part B, you'll see it's improper because there's an infinity in the bounds. There's two ways to have improper integrals. The bounds, which you can think of as horizontally improper, and then things blowing up, which is vertically improper. So how do you handle improper integrals? Well, one thing to do is just say, look, let me put the improperness to the side, do the integral, and then I'll say, well, what happens? So let's do it that way. I, I kind of like that approach. And so how does one do that? Well, don't think of it as a definite integral for right now. And so we'll integrate 1 over x log of x to the half dx. And I say, all right, well, how would we go about this integral? We see a log x. We also see a 1 over x right there. This is signaling to us Think substitution. So in particular, it's saying think the substitution of u equals log. So then du would be 1 over x dx. And if you carry out this substitution, well, the 1 over x dx, that's our du. And then this log x downstairs, that's 1 over u to the half. Or if you like, that's really u to the minus a half du. All right, well, u to the minus a half uh, would be what? The integral of that. You'd add 1, negative a half plus 1 is positive a half, divide by a half. So that becomes 2u to the 1 half. And throw in a c, and then say, well, wait, u was log. So this is 2 square root log x plus c. So that's log to the one half, you know, I mean, square root. Why not? Why not? Okay. So, now we say, okay, how do we handle the improperness? Well, the way you handle an improper integral, properly handle an improper integral, is by limits. So we're going to think of this as the limit as a approaches 1 from above. And we're integrating from a to 2 of 1 over x log x to the half. Well, because we did the integral, we say, well, look, this is the same as the limit as a approaches 1 from above of 2 root log x. Evaluate that from a to 2. And uh, all right, well, that's the limit as a approaches 1 from above. And what we have, we have 2 square root log 2, and then subtract 2 square root log a. Now, what do you do when you have a limit? The first thing you do is plug it in. As long as you have a reasonable, also known as continuous function, you plug in and see what happens. All right, 2 root log 2 is a constant, whatever. Log of 1, 0. No problems. There's no division by 0. Life is good. And we say, ah, great. So this becomes 2 square root log 2. And that's the answer. All right. So that was pretty good. Let's do that again. Because we have a chance, right? There's a part B. Say, so, okay. All right. Channel our same... Let's not stress about being improper. Let's just do the integral. So what do we have? Well, the integral 1 over x log x. We say, hey, we again see that 1 over x action going on. So we'll let u equal the log. du is 1 over x dx. 
So what would this become? Well, it would become the integral. The 1 over x dx is du. And the log x downstairs is u. So that's log of u plus, of course, some c, or log of log x. It's a log log. And uh, mathematicians, some mathematicians are, they, they really go in for like log log. And there are even mathematicians who have log log log. And there's even a, a colleague of mine who once used as their email address, log 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 log, you know, several logs. Uh, because, well, mathematicians love these things. Now, Let's come back and say, well, how do we handle? Well, we have our improperness is at the upper bound. So we say, okay, take a look at the limit as b goes to infinity, integral 2 to b of uh, 1 over x log x dx. Well, that's the limit as b goes to infinity of, we have the antiderivative, log log, evaluate 2 to b. And, uh, okay, so this is our limit as b goes to infinity of log log b, subtract log log 2. Now, the log log 2, that's not our concern. Let's think about this. And just sort of work your way in reason. What do we know? We know b is getting large, because that's what we're saying. b goes to infinity. So b is getting big. What happens to log in the long run? As your input gets big, log gets big. Very slowly. It takes its time. It's definitely not going to get there quickly, but it will get big. Okay, so we now know since b is getting big, log of b is getting big. So what about log of log of b? It also gets big. Again, super duper slowly. It drags its heels. It's like a young kid not wanting to leap. It just it does not want to grow big. But it will. It will. So what's happening is that this blows up. Well, it doesn't matter what log log 2 is. Hopeless to compensate when you have something getting huge. So the answer is infinity. gets arbitrarily large. Oh, wow. And that's it. Whew. This test was a workout. I'm not gonna, gonna say otherwise. But you know, all our ideas were there. And uh, so I guess, you know, make sure you know your ideas. And I went slow. And uh, I know you can do it. I, 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 it's not an easy test that we just did but you can do it. Practice, practice. Take your time, don't panic. Panic makes mistakes. We are calm. All right, well, thank you for joining me. I hope that this helps. I hope you do great. I know you can. And maybe someday we'll get to meet again. Bye.